Next is Sean Gorski. Sean is production manager with many off-Broadway credits at the Minnie Lane, uh, Barrow Group, and Cherry Lane Theater. He recently joined the team at Hudson, the Hudson Theatricals. Last but not least, Pamela Remler is a Broadway stage manager, choreographer, actor, and a trained CSM CCO of Infectious Economics. She was the first CSM for Infectious Economics with the first Broadway play to return after COVID shuts down Broadway. Um, she will be joining Lincoln Center to help open their season with Infectious econo Economics as the COVID supervisor for Flying Over Sunset starting in October. So, Pam, first off, the first question for all of you is, what is a CSM COO of Infectious e Economics? Tell us more. Do you want videos or no? Yes, please. Okay, great. Oh, so um, C a CCO was the COVID compliance officer um, position that uh, was created for film and television. And then when theater started to figure out that they were going to have to do the same with this pandemic, they created a position called COVID safety manager. Um, so COVID safety manager is there to protect the full building, uh, basically a production manager for COVID for the entire building. Um, and so with infectious economics, um, that I am a COVID safety manager, and now I'm moving on to opening bigger uh, shows for them as the COVID supervisor with Infectious Economics. Um, Infectious Economics is a company that is led by Dr. Blythe Adamson, a field in field epidemiologist that um, has created an arm for the theatrical uh, world. Um, she works with the White House, she works with the NBA, she works with retail places, uh, and she is uh, partnered with a woman named Charlene Spire. So they created um, Infectious Economics for theater. So I'm their first uh, COVID safety manager. Amazing, thank you, thank you. Uh, heading on, if, since we are talking about a lot about COVID, a few questions that I'm grouping together. So how were these protocols developed and well, what unions were involved in this or rather what government organizations were involved? Um, I think for Broadway, um, I'm part of Actors' Equity Association because I'm also a stage manager. Well, I am a stage manager. I was a retired performer many years ago. But um, so the union created their own protocols where they thought would be um, safe to help reopen Broadway. Um, as we see, the, the, the virus has continued to change and, and mutate and uh, create strains, et cetera. So um, they created their own protocols with an academic um, epidemiologist uh, when I took this job, we didn't quite know exactly what the job was going to be. Luckily, I was working partnered with Sean Gorski, the production manager here. And soon we found out together that this is this is a bigger job. It's a production manager for COVID. Um, so with uh, Blythe's um, guidance with Matt Ross, they partnered on this show together uh, to figure out what they wanted the protocols to be. It was led by Blythe and agreed upon by producer what would be the best way to protect um, everyone involved, designers, cast, crew, ushers, concessions. Um, and so our protocols with IE, Infectious Economics, is much more detailed and more strict than our unions would be. Um, so she followed the viral load and she followed, uh, you know, the, the breakthroughs that were happening. Um, and this is what she does for a living with, you know, uh, with the White House, with the NBA, and with many sports. So that's what she did with that. So she created the protocols, trained me on the protocols, and then uh, we went forward from there. Amazing. Yes, theater is a sport, sometimes a contact sport. Um, <laughs> speaking of uh, shops and production management wise, Sean Gorski, how has this been implemented within the shop protocols? Uh, well, so uh, to your question about which unions were, which, sorry, my Google's right now. Okay, Google, stop. Um, uh, to your question about which unions were involved. So there were a number of different protocols developed with different unions. So uh, per what Pam said, um, Infectious Economics developed their own protocol that was modeled for each individual production. Um, but, uh, Per the shop, we, um, we're beholden to the Local One protocol at Hudson Scenic, um, and then modified a little bit because the Local One protocol is, um, uh, 
it, it is protecting their union members, but also protecting uh, protecting the work per se. And so we felt that it wasn't necessarily uh, strong enough at the shop. So we've sort of adapted as we um, as we observe the virus going up and down, and with the Delta variant, we've. Uh, added mask mandates back into the shop at certain times, uh, depending on uh, what the what the community spread has been uh, overall. Um, it depends on the, the the local one mandate for the shop is not that we have to do any testing. So we also have specific mandates for mask wearing at the shop for visitors. Um, everyone has to be vaccinated. Um, so it definitely makes for, um, it feels like a safe space for us, but also trying to make sure that we are covering our bases uh, for liability, so. Amazing. Um, you know, I have to say, like, what I really loved about the protocols on our show, that what Pam, Pam and Dr. Blythe has done is that the rules were constantly shifting based on what was happening with the virus. You know, what I'm seeing with a lot of the unions with, like, equity um, is that they'll, like, set rules that'll last, like, Till the end of the year but it's like the you know like the statistics are changing on a daily basis and it's like the rules become outdated they need to get stronger or weaker or you know like and there's just like I, what i appreciated from passover is that it, you felt like there was someone watching us day to day tracking what was happening in the real world and applying it to our show Totally, totally. Speaking of, right, as we, we talked about, like, this shifting and changing, who actually has the final say in approving the COVID protocols as it changes? On, on a, well, okay, on, on an IE show is the one way I only really know it. Uh, and that would be Blythe with the producer. So, um, like Wilson was saying, there was a time where uh, the breakthroughs were happening, so we increased our testing cadence to every single day. Or um, if somebody wasn't feeling well and we needed to do something, we would increase it or we'd go back to, we were usually at four times a week PCR testing. We don't really use antigen tests here. Um, so it is both the producer and the epidemiologist on this show. And what's been great on Passover is that they are a great partner. They're, they're great partners. They, they believe in the science and they work very closely together to make those decisions. And Matt Ross is very educated on COVID. She found, he found her about 15 months ago when COVID was happening in a COVID think tank and pulled her out and plugged her out and said, help me with theater. So he, I have to say, Matt Ross was a leader and very courageous about following science and hiring a person to do that for the production. Yeah. What I will say is that in, in my uh, experience with other shows over the course of this fall reopening is that uh, not all productions are that way unfortunately, or, you know, I mean, in, uh, to each their own, but um, more often than not, it is the producer who has final say in the protocols and how they're applied. Um, and that applies in different ways, um, because like with, um, with uh, Passover, we have two different uh, groups, essentially. We have the employees of the theater owner or the Jujamson employees, and we have the employees of the show um, and in doing so, uh, fortunately for us at Passover, um, oftentimes infectious economics was setting the overall protocols, um, at least for anyone that interacted with cast, who is the, um, the employees of the show. Um, but oftentimes the employees of the theater owner, um, who are the stagehands and the front of house staff, um, are under a different protocol than the payroll of the show. And that's based on the liability burden of uh, what the show is willing to bear versus what the theater owner is willing to bear. And also the costs of what the show is willing to bear versus what the theater owner is willing to bear. So. And luckily with, Gia, luckily with Jude Jamson, um, they worked uh, seamlessly with Matt because Matt was um, pretty adamant about following IE's protocols. So we did create all the protocols for front of house at Passover. Awesome. We keep talking, we talk a lot about what these protocols are. Has it been written down? Is it shareable at all? If it is, can, is there a link that we can find one? <laughs> I wish I was that savvy uh, to give you a link, Ryu. But um, uh, it is written down. I mean, um, 
we developed everything together, uh, Dr. Adamson and, my, and myself and Charlene Spire, who's the theater liaison for the company IE. Um, and now we, um, we have a theater playbook. Uh, it's 32 pages long. Um, we have built it and structured it so that every CSM that is hired underneath IE and trained underneath IE, that this is the playbook we use. And we share that playbook with the producer and with the GM uh, so that everyone's on the same page. They understand why it gives them everything, uh, everything from why these protocols are, they, what they are, to where to order contacts, um, uh, everything that they need to do. Um, a lot of the CSMs have already trained with me um, for other shows. And so IE now has 10 Broadway shows now. So um, at this point, IE is, she can't take any more, we can't take any more clients right now, but we do have an umbrella now of 10 shows. So that's about 50 CSMs. And we're all, they're all trained underneath this playbook that uh, Dr. Adamson, myself and Charlene put together, learning on Passover what worked. That's amazing. Yes, really, truly thank you to Dr. Blythe, our um, health economist and our producer, Matt Ross. Um, great, great, great. Speaking of um, parameters wise, set design wise, Wilson, were you ever given a COVID specific parameter? You know, not really. Like, uh, there was never like a thing where like the actor has to be a certain distance away from the audience, which, why, do we know why that is? Yes. Can, can you explain that? And then I'll have more to say. Yes, because um, our priority is to create a building that is um, COVID free and a building that uh, has, uh, you know, the quality of airflow with HEPA filters, as well as the new H, uh, HVAC systems, as well as the MERV 13 plus filters everywhere. Um, and, and then I don't know if you guys know this, but Dr. Adamson actually crawled in all these spaces with Matt before this show. They went everywhere from the grid to underneath the plumb to everywhere um, to check every bit of area that would have stagnant air. And she would change that for the space. So what she wants to do is create a, a safe environment so that we can create art. And so even when I spoke to the union about it, you know, I asked them, do you, are, are there limitations that we should be doing? Um, they don't, they didn't have any limitations for the protocol and what we were going to do on stage because we are going to create the environment that it is, you're not going to be performing <laughs> unmasked with COVID, especially if you're testing PCR testing four times a week. Um, so then you are ahead of the virus. So we wanted to be ahead of the virus in the building instead of catching the virus when it's in the building. Because once you catch it in the building with unmasked actors, then you have a breakout, break, you know, a breakthrough and a breakout in the, in the, in the room. So um, there was no reason to create any form of restriction for the arts. That's not what we were there to do. We we're there to create a safe environment so art can happen. Pam, just remind me though too, I don't believe there were equity protocols until we were at tech. I <laughs> love you for that one. I, so, I beg for the equity protocols there, for so long. There so was, we were following, yeah, we were following IE's protocols, but I was having end of day meetings every single day in rehearsal with equity regarding my questions um, and begging them for an actual uh, list of their equity protocols. The reason we weren't worried is because we knew our protocols were gonna be made more, way more uh, uh, strict and uh, test with testing policies and um, following the science, following that's in the air. It's not about droplets. It's not where, it's not, it's not been proven that that's where we're gonna spread it. So there's no reason to do the minor small things. We need to focus on the environment and the space that we're in. So luckily, uh, we had several meetings with Equity, Blythe and I, and, uh, but you're right, Sean, we didn't get the actual final um, equity protocols in a PDF form at all until the day before uh, actors were moving into the theater, which was frustrating, but I wasn't worried because we were being led by a top-notch epidemiologist, so if we did what she said to do, I was not worried. Uh, you know, I'm doing shows in D.C. right now, and the D.C. area have all agreed. They, they, the rule that in D.C. is that the actors cannot be 
um, you have to stay six feet away from the audience, the actors. So it's affecting the designs of my shows there. And then like off Broadway, I, I just had a meeting with MCC and their rule is I think three feet or four feet. So it's just like, there's all these very random rules and um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it, 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 but then, you know, I go to California and I literally saw it was outdoors, but a show in which like the audience was like, the, the actors were in the audience and they were like touching each other and like passing things to each other. And it was like, what is going on? I felt so, I felt so like unsafe, but they were doing it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I would have, if it was, if, if it was my opinion, I would not put an actor out in the audience. Uh, not that that's anything. Um, we have all vaccinated audience members. We all know in New York, it's a vaccinated audience and they're masked, but um, still we know there's, there's breakthroughs. And what we do know in the building is that we, I know that everyone's tested and I know before they come to work the next day, within the eight hours that they were tested and by the time they got to work, I know that they're all negative. I know everyone that walked in the building was negative, including our concessions or our ushers or anything like that. So it's a very safe environment to do it that way. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know about the other states. I've always felt bad for all of you designers jumping from show to show and different protocols. I kind of wish there was one umbrella and uh, just following the science of it all. But um, I feel that if you, if you create a safe environment with true PCR testing so that by the time show, someone shows up with a PCR test that's positive, they haven't even reached infection, infectiousness. If you are, if you're testing with an antigen and they, it, can, it, it finds the protein, mostly it's, they're going to be already infectious in the building. So I feel like if we keep the virus out of the building, we can do the art. I think that's what we should be doing. And luckily we're all vaccinated. So if we do get ill for the most part, we're going to be okay. We want to be able to run a show without, you know, not enough actors to do a show, not enough crew members to do a show, you know? So that's really, I think our eye on the ball is how do you keep the curtain up and how do you do it safely? Absolutely. This show was wonderful that everybody was fascinated. Have there been any hesitancy on the team at all in general for this production for vaccination? Is that a question for me? For yeah. yes, for anybody. Um, I mean, there was there was what when they were casting, and there was there was one person that was afraid of the vaccine, and which I thought was, you know, the way they handled it was beautifully. Um, Dr. Adamson actually got in touch with that particular person, and walked them through and educated them through the vaccine, how it works, how it works in the body, how you were going to be okay. She went to the appointment with this person. She followed through with a text. It was amazing to see what she did because she could see that this person was actually afraid. This was not a pushback, a political pushback. This person was actually afraid of being vaccinated. And now he's so grateful that he's vaccinated and he's joyful. He's, he's made his Broadway debut and with her help. So, but that was really the only person that we had that needed a little bit of help and guidance and, and that person got it. Absolutely. What about the shops, Sean? Has there been others? Um, overall, we've had fairly good um, vaccine sort of buy-in. Um, there's definitely a small contingent of people who are hesitant for various reasons. Um, and um, we actually did have uh, um, uh, an exemption on our show um, early on with one of our crew members who has an autoimmune disease that uh, he was recommended by his physician that he shouldn't, he should not take it because uh, it would cause an autoimmune reaction. Um, and uh, it was handled really well. The theater owner, uh, it was a part of their protocol that he was allowed to work as long as he was isolating, wearing a specific type of mask and was testing a lot. Um, and so it was handled in a way that, that felt, that made everyone feel safe. Um, and also was able to, you know, not Im impede someone from employment. So um, it was good. Yeah. And as far as the shop goes, um, there was sort of a mandate laid down that by a certain date, you needed to prove that you were starting your vaccine process. Um, and I thank Neil for that. Uh, Neil Mazzella, who runs Hudson, he essentially sort of just said, you got to be vaccinated if you want to work here. And, uh, and it worked. I think, I mean, I, we, we don't have anybody who isn't vaccinated who works in the shop. So, 
That's amazing. What about you, Wilson, in your studio? I mean, you are my studio. It's the two of us. We've kind of formed a bubble. I mean, you know, it's... I, I don't know if Pam would approve of our work bubble, but it is what it is. <laughs> I bet I would. I thank you. But when, uh, when, when other people come, when directors come or other designers come, we all mask up. Yes. Um, amazing. Thank you for that. So continuing on, on the, the route of vaccines and shots, does this production have any policies on getting booster shots or will there be, do you feel both in the shops and in, um, in shops and in other productions, would there be a mandate for a booster shot? Do we feel? Um, I don't, I, I don't think um, our epidemiologists would mandate anything that's going to come from the CDC. It's going to come from the federal government. Um, I think we would certainly, uh, she'll follow the science. And if it's showing that too many people with a certain type of vaccine, you know, are getting ill, especially on a show, I'm sure she would, you know, encourage them, talk to them and try to help them through that. Um, but right now it's not really being uh, talked about much right now. Um, most of the, most of the vaccines are doing okay. And with the Pfizer going from what I think was like 90 to 70 now it's, it's down in the efficacy. So, and they're in now, the booster is available for that. Um, Moderna's kind of holding up there and, you know, Johnson & Johnson's gonna need some help, um, but that's not gonna be ever, we're, we're never gonna mandate that part of it. I think it's gonna be led first by the CDC and, um, and the federal government. And uh, she's part of that. She still is, she has her weekly um, uh, White House meetings. And so she's a part of all that conversation. So as soon as she knows, we know, and uh, we'll be certain. She she likes to use more of a, I'm, I'm here to guide you. And she does a beautiful job at that. Yes, guiding and having a leadership in here is absolutely important. Speaking of which, when there is, if there was a breakthrough case in the production, how does one handle that? Well, um, if, if there is a breakthrough case, which is going to be a breakthrough case because we're all vaccinated. So, um, and if there is a breakthrough case, we have a tree of who we talk to first. And um, that person is notified through um, also our lab. Our lab is HIPAA protected. So that person is, uh, they speak, I speak to them. And then the, the lab speaks to them to give them their full uh, diagnostics to let them know. Um, and then they will, CDC guideline, they will, um, isolate for 10 days, we will watch their symptoms. I stay in touch with everyone with a daily health uh, check. All these people know that, sadly, they're still on there. But um, I'll make sure that they're okay for those 10 days. And as they're at home, they will be PCR testing daily. And then those PCR tests are actually um, broken down with viral loads by our epidemiologist. So she can actually follow the beginning of a load and then a curve at the end of the load so that she can actually see when that person is no longer infectious. It could be 12 hours. Uh, it could be five days, it could be 10 days. It matters what that immune system is doing. So um, then she will make the decision of when someone comes back in and she will, she will give the clearance of someone from being positive returning back to the building. Amazing. You know, I, I wanna say, like, I feel like on our show there has, I feel like on other shows, when there's been a positive case, it's been like chaos and panic and confusion. But on our show, it's like there's a protocol for all of these things. Like, re remember you, there was like a game that you played early on where it was like, if, if this person becomes positive, what happens? If this person becomes positive, what happens? There's just like, it, everything was thought through and it wasn't, like when a, if a positive case comes up, it's not like sudden franticness and you have to like cancel shows. That's, that's true. She, she, um, she wants to inform everyone so that this, this virus is with us and we should be able to just understand the virus and, and get knowledgeable of how to handle the virus. And, um, and with that said, she did educate us with a card game and she would pass around cards. Everyone would pull out of a PCR test and everyone would pull out an antigen test and they would go around and you would quickly see if someone tested positive, that person was out of the game. She would do, she still plays basketball, sit out of the game on the bench. 
Um, and then we would go through with another round of exposed, which means everyone would take an antigen to see if they have the protein in them. And then if someone else got, it, it was a great informative test so that now the cast, they really understood like, okay, I could say you're exposed. They know what that means. Um, or you're not directly exposed. They know what that means. And though we handle it in a very informative email and every single person in the building receives an email if there is a positive in the building. And no one, I, I was so grateful at the calmness in the, in the building, if and when a positive would happen was, Everyone went on and did their job because they understood that there was an umbrella of an epidemiologist watching the building and, and myself, and we're taking care of those people and we're taking care of the building. So it never seemed to be, it just seemed to be an everyday, I don't know, you guys could tell me you experienced it, but, but with that said, I think that uh, not teaching everybody that this virus is here, no one's responsible for it, no one should feel guilty, um, follow the protocols, wear a mask at all times. If you're going to distance, you know, I mean, if you're going to eat, stay distance away from somebody, never two people unmasked. These are the things that we constantly would remind people and they learn very quickly. Oh, wow. This is an easy way to keep going, you know, keep going in the business. That's awesome. That's awesome. To go back a few steps um, in terms of this testing constantly every day that we had to do are, uh, is this the difference then between like how we don't test antigens versus PCR and why is PCR better than antigens? Well, with, with us right now, we're, we do pool testing with a, a lab called Miramis and um, it's a really, it's a great economical way of being able to afford PCR testing, um, polymerase chain reaction tests. So it's going to actually find the RNA of the virus. Um, and we and it picks it up very quickly. It's very sensitive. The lab is, it's a, a very accurate lab, so it's very sensitive. So you may find it so early on, no one either has the symptoms or the viral load is so low. We have them stay out a day, and they're they're not infectious at all. So no one's been directly you know in, um, exposed. Um, so the PCR is a very it's an accurate test. It's going to tell you if you have the actual virus in you, where the antigen is going to tell you a piece of the protein of the virus. And usually when it does pick up the protein, you're probably three days into having COVID, which means then you're infectious. So what we would like to do and why we cho choose to do the PCR testing instead of antigen testing is because you can catch it so early. And if you PCR test frequently, then you're catching it so early, let's say, Wilson tests negative, and then the next day he's positive. And then the next day, you know, we, we go back one day and go, okay, he was negative on this day, positive on this day, and then we follow him. We can see a viral load quick, quicker than anything else was well, really the only way to see the viral load. And then you also know he's not infectious yet. So you do need antigens in the building for other reasons. Um, someone, someone felt, you know, oh, I, I don't feel right today. And I, I, can hand them an antigen, they have to take that test by themselves with me there. And these are high-end antigen tests through um, labs, not the off table off the market, you know, by Naxis, um, which are fine to use, but um, she has, she has requirements for a different test and why. Um, so it's just a more accurate way of knowing if you have the virus versus wait until you find the protein and then you're already, you could have spread it. So it's a, it's a better way of maintaining a COVID tree building. Amazing. And also, you know, since capital reigns supreme, what makes this lab more economical than other versions of getting a group PCR test? Well, I don't know other, other labs that do group PCR tests, but what I do know that a lot of other shows are doing and or movies and film and television are doing, um, they're doing, uh, separate PCR testing for each sing every single person. So that person's saliva or nasal swab is, is run per person. And that's very costly. Um, for us, I can put 24 people into one test and that one test costs like $300, but that's 24 people in that test. So, and it's an accurate test, which comes down to cheaper than buying a Binax off the shelf at $27 and you're giving somebody an antigen test. So 
I don't know much more about the other labs, the competitive labs. I do know that Miramis won the X prize, which is the big scientific prize that you can win for doing good in society and with science um, because they were the leading uh, pool testing with New York City when COVID got really bad. I have visited that lab. I've met the lab technicians and scientists there. It's incredible what they're doing and they're still developing and making things better. They can actually test now 48 in one pool. They are still just waiting for the FDA to say okay to it, even though they know it's accurate. They're just still waiting for that approval. So think about that. 48 people can go into one test and all these other, you know, paying PCR separate diagnostics take longer and they're more expensive. Wow. And correct me if I'm wrong, is that if someone comes back positive, they find a, a extra piece of saliva from each one and test all of them is that the case so what happens let's say pretend like this is your pool and we have 20 we have 24 test tubes and um they test all of that and let's say a, that pool becomes positive if that pool becomes positive because those weren't separate diagnostic tests what they do is they go into which is why i make you guys spit a half of a vial or three fourths in there is so that if it is positive they'll go dip back into there and do separate pcrs and they they because it's a pool testing lab and not a uh, just a direct uh, diagnostic, even though they can and they will do diagnostics for me, but they pair them side by side by side by side to find out where the positive is. And the last two people that show positive, you'll pair those off and test those separately. So, uh, and that's how you find out no one needs to come back to the building. It's all done in the lab. And then within like 45 minutes or so, I know who's positive and we can take it from there. Wow. So I have, a, I have a question. So if someone does pull a, a test positive, if, if the poll test positive, then suddenly that test is now a very expensive day of testing, right? Uh, no, it's actually included in the, in, in, the, in the testing. It's not like we're charged for another oh. round of testing. Nice. No, it's, it's really, Miramis Lab in Brooklyn is really wonderful. And I actually, I, I talk, by text with the with the senior scientist and the uh, CEO as well as their rep on a daily basis. We're developing even better software right now for Broadway for our next ten shows, so that we can actually do the umbrella that we want to do for you guys. So we're we're getting a whole umbrella now with them as well as with Airtable, so that we can create an oversight of. You know, Wilson's going to three more shows. Oh, is he tested? Sure, he's done. Great, he's been. Oh, he's healthy. But it's, it's we're creating a whole software right now with um, an MIT tech person with IE partnering now with Miramis for our theatrical. I have another follow-up question. Why isn't every show doing those? I can't answer that question. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, not it's, it's, it's not money. It's not really. No, it's not money, in my opinion, because if you see a show shut down for three hundred and something thousand dollars for that night, it, it can't be money. This is where Matt Ross has got it right. Um, I mean, if you, I mean, and Blythe is an economist. That's what she does for a living. She is an economist. It's the reason her business is called Infectious Economics. Um, I don't know all the numbers to it. Um, uh, you can also even she's actually even pared it down to some shows just use her as consultation um if that's what they prefer to do instead of using a whole umbrella of a csm trained uh ie person and doing all the protocols and having her come in and uh i mean we just finished the walkthrough with lincoln center which was five hours with her and myself and and uh the project manager the building person the hr person we crawled up into the grid She's, you know, she wants to get into every space to know that the guy pulling the rope is just as safe as the guy on the ground saying the lines. So in my opinion, I mean, I just think it's a, it's an industry to protect. So either we're going to protect it, you know, so I don't think it's, I don't really think it's about money. Pam, does infectious yeah. economics offer any sort of guarantee or carry any sort of liability insurance to cover the show in case of loss of show yep well i don't know about the financial but she's it's medically you are covered for any legal anything science, sure, but I mean, science like 
if the cost if the cost of using infectious economics because uh, uh, there are a number of GMs who, are, who have in-house uh, COVID compliance managers um, because their liability insurance covers their COVID compliance managers. So that I'm wondering whether or not infectious economics offers any sort of liability coverage to the show. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the business, uh, the business side of uh, agreements. Yeah. I don't know, because I mean, there's definitely a cost associated of having an outsourced, because there are a number of outsourced COVID uh, supervisors um, that are that are all in the same business, infectious economics, Modi. Um, there's another one that we're working with, with Freestyle. So like there there are multiple people charging multi multiple Free, rates. Freestyle's gonna use, no, but Freestyle's gonna use Miramis because Freestyle was gonna hire me. <laughs> so using, Freestyle is gonna use- But we're not they're using- They're using Miramis. Yes, I know. I, I, your guy trained your your guy shouted me. Um, so Christopher, your CSM. Um, I don't know. The, I don't know the business side of um, what all that is, but there is a CEO and a, a head person. Her name is Lisa. Um, that works with IE. I mean, of course, it's uh, so mainly. I think what Matt has brought up with her and and that I've been a part of in meetings is that liability wise. Um, no one could be sued for any reason of COVID or loss of life or anything like that because it's completely covered with science, uh, uh, an or ordering physician as well as an epidemiologist on the shows. Yeah, no, I don't think you. I don't think it's more. I don't think it's about negligence. I think it's about commercial theater in general. About how most any commercial theater production is a gamble, and so each person is taking a a risk about how much financial liability they're willing to incur. Exactly right with COVID yeah. um, and if they do it for less expensive, they're making the bet that they can either make more money or that they can run the show for longer. Um, but if they do it for less money and they do it with antigens and you have breakouts and your show closes, what is the difference in price between a show being closed and you lose 300 to 400,000 that night versus if you test the whole group, it's $4,000 for the week, and you know you have a COVID-free building, four thousand a week or three hundred fifty thousand every time you have to shut down a show, and then you have to wait another ten days for each one of those company members to sit out. Yeah, I mean, I think again with the numbers, uh, I, again, this is getting very nitty gritty, but I don't think it's four thousand a week to have. Uh, it matters with production. Product. Well, no, no, it's testing. That was the part of the Yeah, testing. that's just testing. It's significantly more than $4,000 a week to have infectious economics work on your show. It, so. it's, now, it's now a boutique. There's different ones, and she has, uh, she has different prices for different services. She's helping Disney now as well. So yeah. she's not there fully. They're not, she's not full umbrella for Disney. She's... Uh, totally. Yeah, so there's different things. Yes. I mean, we've talked a lot about commercials, right? Has this trickled down to... Not trickled down to. Trickle across to... Uh, non-commercial productions? And if so, are there resources like this for non-commercial productions that we know of? I don't know. I haven't worked on off-Broadways. Anyone else? Well, you're doing a not-for-profit show. No, off-Broadway. Right, but I mean, it's like Lincoln Center is not-for-profit. No, I'm sorry. What was the what was the question for you? No, Non-commercials. Oh, non oh, oh, well, yes, yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I'm hired as a CSM, and uh, Lincoln Center wanted to open up their um, their production safely, and they wanted a, their full building. So we're doing their entire building, staff, front of house, all of the shows. We were hired to do that. I don't know. I don't. Hmm? And you guys are doing Lincoln Center Theater, right? So you're doing you're doing. I'm doing set and doing, uh, the Mitzi Newhouse as well. I'm going to be doing two of the three so far. Gotcha. Are you doing the the Claire Tao, the 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 off off space upstairs? I don't know yet. I don't know which one they want me on right now. I'm starting with Flying Over Sunset, and I've been offered one of the two next ones. They just want me to stay on board. I right. don't know where they're going to put me. I'll go anywhere. Lincoln Center. They've they've done it right. I'm like yes sir, yes ma'am. I will be there. <laughs> so happy to be there in any space that they have. I we did tour it all. I was in the mid sea. I was up in their off route, their smaller space. Is it called the MC three? Uh, LCT3, yeah. That's where Passover. Yes, there. Passover uh, yeah, and, and yes, I've been, we, we, we did all of them. And so we walked through all of them so that we could give them protocol for every one of their theaters, as well as um, 
what to do with their airspace rooms, dressing rooms. Uh, we've moved a lot of their, their personnel, people, staff, which ushers would have been backstage. There's a space for them with their lockers. Now they have a front of house space. Everything's being moved around after um, our meeting um, with uh, Lincoln Center and with Life. So the whole building is working together. They have a, they have a wonderful lady also to this, they're an institutional person for COVID. So they've done it right. They've got an institutional person and then they've gotten CSM supervisors per show. And each one of those shows will have an assistant um, plus a front of house boots on the ground person. So each show has its own group, but plus one person that's overseeing um, staff and everything else. Pam, have you found in theaters that are not, like Lincoln Center obviously has a lot of institutional support, um, but in other commercial productions, have you found pushback with say like moving the usher? Cause I mean, like with each Broadway production you've got, you know, up to 11 unions, I think represented in each space. So have you found um, that the different unions have been more or less accepting of the changes that you and Blythe wanna make within their space? Not here. No, I mean, it's because it's led by the producer. I mean, the producer wants the protocols to be what they are with Blythe because he wants a safe building front and, and back of the house. So there was no pushback. That was just, that, were the, that was the protocols for this building. I mean, I don't know any other buildings. I don't work in them. So no, I haven't felt any of any of those. In fact, you know, a lot of these ushers and a lot of these people that work in this theater know me very well because I did five years of Jersey Boys with them. So they are family. And so they have said to me, they, they're, they've been very vocal about feeling well taken care of because often some front of house people, concessions and bar people are not taken care of. They're like the last people thought of and they are beyond grateful. I mean, I know they're kids, you know, so that's been, that's been wonderful to experience, you know, them to say all that, but I don't, I, this is my, this is where I am. Drew Jamson is where I am. And then Lincoln Center is where I am. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just a, 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 another question before you have to head out for more COVID protocol work. What is the tech process been like for the creative team? And like, if, if we, starting from walking in to the, uh, the theater itself for that day, what is that process, both for production design and for CSM? Wait, I'm not quite un understanding the question. So what has it been for the creatives, the what, policies or? Yes, what is, if, if you were to be on this production, take us through your day, your usual day for tech um, and, and rehearsals. I'll let so, Pam talk first because she has to leave soon. <laughs> well, I mean, and yet, yeah, well, I mean, you guys all know because you went through it. Um, it's all planning ahead. It's planning up to three days ahead for everybody. And I think that's all, that's been what's been a change for everyone in the theater industry, I think. Um, and now we know that it takes time to get a test result back if that is the protocol of the building. But um, uh, I'm in touch, usually I'm in touch with the production manager and, and Sean was really great in the beginning because we were figuring this out together and I didn't have another person there. Uh, now on these other shows, we will not do that that way. Um, there will be a CSM, I will be there for load in every single day. There will be somebody at the studio. So we know more what needs to be you know needed there. Um, but uh, pretty much Sean would get in touch with me. He would kind of tell me what was going on if I knew, and I would write up to all of my designers, everyone was always included in all my emails, what, when testing was, what the protocol was, and if you had any question, you would contact me and say, hey, I need to come in tomorrow for the, the run through. Is there a way I can get in tomorrow? And I'm like, well, there's too many people in the building tomorrow, but maybe we can do the next day. Send me, it's a lot of email corresponding back and forth to each person so that you can take care of each person and make sure that they're safe when they come to the building and then the, that the room stays safe because you have unmasked actors. So it's, it's a constant email back and forth, getting clearances, making sure someone is tested. They send me their result back. I file it. Um, I know they're clear for the day. By the end of the night, I do a, a, a stage door clearance um, list for the stage door every single night that changes every night it's color coded for the stage door so that they know that these people can come in or this person can only come in on this day um so it's it's a constant 
email. Yes, you're coming in. It's, that's what's happening right now with this videotaping of the show that's about to happen. I have a whole new crew coming in for the testing. So I'm with that kind of manager telling them this is what we need to do. And now I have a core of emails of those people. So it's, it's a lot of conversation, but the good thing is, is that when you do the testing where I do the testing, I get to see you, I get to meet you. I get to see that you're healthy. I get to know you. I like that part of it. Um, and then I never had any pushback from there. I feel like they saw that I was taking care of them. I showed them respect by showing them, I know your name. I know who you are. I know what you need to do. My background's in theater. I know it's important for you to be in this meeting. Um, so I really, that that is important that it's a, somebody in this position does understand theater, does understand what designers do and creatives and production managers. Everybody has a tough job. And how can we do it together? And how can we communicate to like, get this moving forward? And luckily we didn't have to cancel anything. We didn't have to cancel rehearsal. We were able to do everything safely without canceling. So it's, it's a lot in one day. Um, Hence, there will be more than one. I'm a department of head and, and one on this show. It is a small show, but it doesn't matter when you get into production because it's the same amount of people in production to do a play. I mean, you're, you still have your director, your associate director, your designer, your associate designer, your production manager. They're so, you know, so uh, that's, that's my day. I don't know if that sounds chaotic, but it's really not. Um, it's just communicating. And, and planning ahead, schedule, scheduling ahead if your protocol is to have a PCR test. Others Does that answer that. the question? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. It's, it's different. Like it's not, everyone had to adapt and Pam, your, your patience with everyone was uh, exquisite. So thank you. Oh, um, Sean, you were great too. But it was, it was definitely, it. It, was not, it was not a process that anybody really, it doesn't come natively. Everybody just feels like, you know, part of the creative process is that you can enter the room, you can be a part of any, you know, the conversations are fluid, you should be around, you know, like that is a part of the process that everyone expects to be normal. And there was a lot of, you know, a, a lot of learning, especially because we were the first show back and we didn't have super clear protocols from any of the unions um, about how we're supposed to behave and we were adapting. And so that was something that, you know, as everybody just sort of the nice thing was, is that we had, you know, pretty much universal buy-in from everybody on the team, creatively, crew-wise, um, uh, from, you know, management's perspective, that we just had everybody sort of going in the same direction. And I attribute a lot of that to Pam and, and Blythe and just sort of just guiding everybody. So thank you. Aw, thanks, Sean. I have to say, too, that I said before, you know, doing this job is not an easy job. It's not a fun job being a COVID supervisor, but... Um, protecting an industry I love and I know and um, but working on this show everyone was kind and uh, generous and uh, thoughtful respectful they asked the right questions and, and uh, they wanted what was right to serve the play and to serve the show and to take care of each other and that was what was really special in the show because it could go the other way and, and when it goes the other way it's very hard to protect people who are not on board. And so this show was a complete joy in that way. From Matt Ross to Blythe, to designers, to production managers, all the way down. It, it just, it was, it was from top to bottom. So thank you guys. It really was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, so if there was three things that you want Wingspace to amplify for the people watching here and Facebook and the recording, to open theater safely during a pandemic, what would the three things be? Vaccination, wear a mask, PCR test. Thank you, Pam. Um, mm -hmm. If you have to step out to, for other duties, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, we'll continue a little bit further, but we absolutely thank you for your work. Um, keeping all of us safe during both the process since the first day of rehearsal all the way through now and continuing for the next three weeks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to step away. I'm a little um, bit well. Yeah. Nice to see you guys. I miss you. Onward. I'm missing you. You know, you know my testing schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Get if you want to spit. Well, now that I know it's the same price, even if someone comes in positive, I might just come in for testing. 
Why not? Why That's not? A You're a designer. Yeah. You're a designer. All right. I am going to listen in while I do some paperwork. And if I do uh, sign off, I sign off. It was a pleasure. It was really nice. My first time ever doing something like this. It was really nice. Oh, thank so, you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining you, us Pam. and for thanks. sharing your experience. We really oh, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Nice to, meet, nice to meet you, Edward. So other questions that we have. Um, there's a question that came up uh, from the audience uh, on a somewhat related note. Um, do any of you, Wilson or Sean, know if there is a potential on the film and IATSE strike that might affect Broadway pertaining to COVID? My, I, I mean, the, the, the bug with all of the numbers around it is the only thing that I know and local one is not on there. But I believe because it's an IATSE strike that they will be supportive but I do not believe that it is going to affect local one. Um, at least that's my understanding, talking to the stagehands that I'm working with. Um, but I do believe that it includes A29. So I don't know what that means for all of you. <laughs> Wilson? Uh, I mean, I fully support um, our brothers and sisters. You know, I don't like saying brothers and sisters are like coworkers. I um, support our co coworkers and I'll do, you know, whatever um, they say we should be doing. But I do think that this is a MOPIC um, strike and I don't think it will bleed over into the theater world, but you know, we're all under the same umbrella. So who knows what will happen? Agreed, agreed. Great, back back to, to the scheduled um, <laughs> talk. Since both of you do work not only on commercial theaters, have you seen, um, and you, we've talked a little bit about it, but have you seen either good or bad versions of COVID safety? while doing productions on non-commercial theater that you've been doing? I mean, yeah, no, you know, I'm, I've worked, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working on like a bunch of other shows as well. And so far, no other show has been as good as Passover has been. Like some of the most lax productions are the ones where like no one knows who's coming. There's no like accountability of who's in the building. Some of them don't do any testing whatsoever. Um, some of them, there, it's just, there's just not the like kind of protocols that I, I was expecting. You know, Passover was my first indoor show coming back. And I thought like, oh, this is what all theater is gonna be like. It's not, and it's kind of scary. Yeah, I think there's definitely, I mean, and varying, I mean, my, my experience has been, um, I've done now, now four commercial Broadway shows coming back and I'm now working on the fourth and then also a, a cup worked on a couple of smaller um, things only in New York though. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, there's a, there definitely felt like more oversight with Passover um, <clears throat> you felt like there was someone co constantly sort of uh, maintaining a level of safety, which was great. Um, uh, and I think that it, it also takes a, a lot of buy-in from the people who are um, the theater owner for commercial shows. So each theater owner sets their own protocols for their staff. <clears throat> so your front of house staff uh, or your you know, your actual, your crew in local one's case is employed by the, by the theater owner. And so depending on if you're in a Schubert house or a G. Jemson house or a Nederlander house or circling the square or a roundabout or um, a Lincoln Center, um, those protocols are gonna vary from just slightly sometimes or greatly other times uh, from uh, the show's protocols. So, and in, in almost every case, the show's protocols are more intensive than the, the theater owner's protocols. Um, and then you get into this interesting negotiation about um, how, how much oversight the show has over the 
the theater owner's employees. Um, not dissimilar to the same sort of how much oversight the show has over the theater owner's employees when it comes to uh, employing stagehands or um, crafting tracks on shows or employing pink contracts. It's, it's actually a very similar um, negotiation of how much influence you can have. Um, and everybody is going in the right direction. Um, I think some people are, are uh, I would, cost conscious would be a, a polite way of putting it. Um, so yeah, um, I haven't had any bad experiences yet, but I've definitely had less oversight, less um, supervision, more, uh, unfortunately, um, more of the protocols or the, um, the supervision being put onto other departments, whether that's stage management, company management, or production management, um, requiring us to sort of be the enforcer of the protocols, um, which is, um, we already have a job. Uh, so, um, so that's been a, that's been a, one of the things that becomes hard is that when you have to sort of put that hat on as well. Um, but, you know, uh, part of being the production manager is being the, the safety supervisor. And, you know, it's, uh, there's been a big move in, in, at least in commercial theaters towards putting production managers, uh, making sure that they're OSHA trained, making sure that they're, you know, site safety supervisor trained and um, rigging trained and making sure that they have the pro proper credentials to be supervising. And so in some senses, it does make sense for production to supervise it, but um, it puts you at odds with people sometimes. And that's not necessarily great for trying to motivate, so. Totally, as a collective, um production itself, if someone uh, essentially doesn't follow the protocol, is that means for firing? Is that, has there been that happening at all in other productions? I, uh, so, so like with all things with unions, um, uh, means for firing is a, uh, it, it takes a lot to remove someone from a production um, if, and, and it, would, it would require multiple infractions or it would require flagrant disregard of rules um, or safety. Um, and one could argue that flaunting uh, safety protocols is a flagrant safety violation and could be a fireable event. Um, but we ha I fortunately have not been put in that position yet where I've, I've had to and everybody, the nice thing is, and I'll say this, with, with, with limited exception, we've had extremely good buy-in from, from the, the unions. Local One, the Teamsters, um, uh, Ag Agva, company management, uh, house management. Like everybody is, um, that's Agva's the wrong one. I don't remember what they're, Appam, Appam is that one. Um, 802, the local musicians, like everybody has been, um, really on board with just getting back to work and doing whatever they need to do to make sure that they can work. And that means following the protocols, whoever their employer is. I think the biggest problem that we're having is the communication between the two protocols and the show setting protocols and then it being different than the theater and no one really knowing who's driving the boat. Absolutely. Wilson? I have nothing to add on that. I'm just a designer. <laughs> who does had, have some fear, especially go even with outdoor productions, right? That you, are in, that you didn't feel too safe watching a show where the actors are next to the audience, even though it is outdoor. I mean, yeah, it was just a little, it was just like, it, it was, it, it felt strange, you know, after coming off of Passover to be seeing actors being that intimate with audience. It, I mean, I don't know. It, I think a lot of people would have felt that way, you know? Like I still have friends who aren't gonna see our show because there's, you know, they have kids under the age of 12 who aren't vaccinated, you know? It's, so it's, you know, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of fear out there. Absolutely, absolutely. But again, there's also, I mean, like to that point, uh, I know like I have, I'm not my company isn't working on it, but I do know that Moulin Rouge um, has, I don't know if anybody on this group has seen Moulin Rouge, but um, they've completely re-choreographed a number, a number of parts of the show because there was a lot of audience interaction and they have removed all of that. Um, so there's no more, 
there's no more cast members in the house in the Lone Rouge, for the, um, both from the equity protocol that says you can't interact with audience members, but also for the safety of both audience members and uh, cast. Are they members. still are they still selling seats inside of the little passerelles? I don't know that actually. Because um, those there. seats are like right in the middle of the right show. There. Yeah, there's no rule on Broadway about how close you can be to the performers, um, at least in the protocols that I'm aware of. Off Broadway, oddly, in the Off Broadway protocol, I believe it's six feet. You have to be six feet from the performer. But um, even in our show, we have an actor walking through the audience and is in the front row singing a song. So, you know, yeah. they're in there. That's practically audience participation. We hope it is. But again, as long as we all stay vigilant, stay safe, vaccinated, mask up, we should be as safe as one can be. I mean, Pam says it's safe, so I, 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 feel, so, I feel very taken care of on our show. If they say it's safe, then I believe them. Amazing. Thank you both. I am actually going to be handing it back to our salon um, producers. Edward? Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Wilson and Sean. And we'll leave the Zoom open for a little bit afterwards if people want to socialize for a little bit. But I would like to go through some closing announcements. Um, Wait, so can I upcoming... make one closing announcement? Sure. Passover is only playing for three more weeks. So see it in the next three weeks or else you're going to regret it. So see it now. Get your tickets now. OK, go right. on. Excellent, excellent. Um, uh, we'll put a link in the chat for, oh, great, someone else is already on this, about where to see more salons and also on our Facebook page. And we're also slowly but surely uh, updating our, our YouTube channel that has uh, an archive of previous salons. Our panelists are paid out of our members' pockets. Um, so if you'd like to support these salons, please send a donation via PayPal to the link in the chat. Also, I think I forgot to tell Sean Wilson and Pamela, you're all getting an uh, honorarium for this. Um, uh, you can join our email list also at Wingspace. Yes, ka-ching. Um, uh, and also we're interested in hearing what uh, people wanna hear. So please feel free to email, email us at salons at wingspace.com. Uh, also, we have a mentorship program. Uh, applications will be coming live in the new year. We just started our current uh, uh, mentorship group. Um, and uh, yeah, those are all the announcements I have. Oh, uh, again, thank you to Pamela Remler, Sean Gorski, Wilson Chin, uh, Ryu uh, Rakul Chan, um, uh, and um, also to our salons committee, Christine Mock, uh, for being here, and uh, Rodrigo Hernandez Martinez and E.L. Hone, uh, and also for those who couldn't make it, Anna Driftwire, Kate Freer, uh, Adrian Jones, Kate Pitt, and Tanya. Or Ilana for helping put these salons, uh, bring these salons to you. So thank you all very much. And we'll leave uh, the Zoom open for a little bit and I'll stop recording. We can dish the dirt. Now to figure out how to stop the Facebook Live. Hmm. Then we're off the record now. Sean, can I ask you? Um, <laughs> Are all the other shows, no one can come in and out of buildings still, right? Like you can't have